My name is Joe Myers and I'm with the Oklahoma State University Library. Today is April 11th, 2012 and I'm in Broken Arrow, Oklahoma, meeting at the home of Richard Sharp. I'll be interviewing Richard today as part of the Spotlighting Oklahoma Oral History Series of the Oklahoma Oral History Research Program. Thank you for taking time to meet here today with me. You're welcome. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Richard, can, can you tell me a little bit about um, uh, where you went to school and uh, a little bit of your, your background before the Marines. Yeah, I, of course, grew up, well, not of course, I grew up in Whiting, Indiana and uh, attended Whiting High School. Mm -hmm. Graduated from there in 1947. Uh, joined the Marine Corps in February of 48 and uh, attended Indiana University for a short period and Tulsa Community College where I studied Chinese language. Okay. So now that was much later as far as the study. That was much later. Studying Chinese but I language. did attend southeastern Louisiana in Hammond, Louisiana for a short for one semester. Okay. What um what kind of uh uh, what kind of work did you do uh, before joining the Marines, or were you in high school at the time? Uh, no, for a short period I worked at Inland Steel, or I'm sorry, Youngstown Cheat and Tube okay. Steel Mill, mm -hmm. and I was in a metallurgical lab. Okay, okay. What um, what prompted you to uh, to join the Marines? I fell in love with the Marine Corps when I was 13 years old, okay. and that's all I ever thought of doing was becoming a Marine. Okay. Was there a specific uh, job or function in the Marines that you wanted to serve? Yes, I wanted to go to sea school. Sea school. And of course they told me I was perfect, but that was a recruiter <laughs> and I never saw sea school. <laughs> what exactly, for those of us who don't know, what exactly is sea school? Uh, it's, it's Marines that are assigned to ships to man the, uh, the guns and also to uh, kind of be a servant to the captain of the ship. So standing guard at his quarters and so forth. I see. So um, so you didn't get to go to sea school? No. Um, and you, you volunteered? Yes, I did. What age were you when you volunteered? I was just, just turned 18. Just 18, uh -huh. okay. And how was the induction process for you? How did that go? Uh, the induction, I, I really joined in Gary, Indiana, but since they, they took me to Chicago to swear me in, so I'm considered to be a Chicago okay. <laughs> inductee, but uh, I had, like I say, I'd really joined in Gary, Indiana, hmm. near my home. Okay. But, uh, so, so you were, you were inducted there, um, how did you transport? Did you go to Pendleton from there? No, I went to Paris Island, South Carolina okay. for boot training. Okay. And went through boot camp from February of 48 to, uh, well, I spent a year at Paris Island. Okay. And then they transferred me to the 1st Marine Division. Okay. And you, so you, when you transported to Paris Island, was that by train from, from Chicago? By train, yes. Okay. Uh -huh. How long of the trip was that? Uh, it, was, it was only 18 hours, something like that. Not too bad. Not too bad. <laughs> but when we got to Buford, which, where the receiving barracks was, mm -hmm. they put us on a train that backed into Paris Island. I thought, now oh, this isn't too good if they have <laughs> to back the train in. <laughs> so. <Right. laughs> okay, so... So you got to Paris Island. Uh -huh. uh, how long was your boot training? Uh, three months. Three months. Three months of health. Okay. Uh, what, can you kind of go through, just detail what, what occurs, or what occurred back then, I should say, for... for oh, I'm sorry. What, can, can you detail uh, for, our, uh, for those who don't know what boot training was like back then? It was very tough. Very tough. Very tough. They tried to break you mentally and physically. Boot camp was extremely difficult. So at, at boot camp, um, is that where everyone learned to fire the BRM and or uh, fire the uh, fire weapons at yes, that time? Yes, we. 
I fired the uh, qualified with the M1 Garand. Oh, see. Which I think is the finest weapon that ever was designed. <laughs> how many how many rounds did that hold? The, uh, the how many M1? rounds? Yeah. We fired 80 rounds for qualification. My goodness. Uh huh. That's quite a bit. Um, after after qualifying, um, what kind of training, specific training, did you have to go through at uh, at boot camp? Oh, it was you recall. a lot of marching, a lot of running, a lot of saying yes sir, no sir, to everything and everyone. Mm -hmm. So it, it was quite an experience. A lot of drill and ceremonies then. Oh yes, yes. Did you did they teach many tactics at that point? In no, time? not at that point. I see. Uh -huh. Where where did where did you pick up your tactical training? I'm sorry. Where where did you pick up your tactical training at? Oh, at per, at Pendleton. At Pendleton. At Camp Pendleton. Okay. I was split. I was uh, squad leader of the first squad in boot camp, mm -hmm. so uh, kind of got a taste of being in charge. I see. At that period. Okay. So after after boot camp, did you remain or er, retain that? Uh, that squad leader position when you went to your uh, uh, your secondary training? No, I didn't. Okay. And that was at uh, Pendleton after that, correct? Pardon? Is that what your, your continuing training after boot camp yes. was at Pendleton? Uh -huh. Yeah. So at Pendleton, that's what actually where you learned your military job? Yes, uh -huh. okay. at Pendleton. What, what was your military job at that time uh, that they were training you for? <clears throat> machine guns, machine like guns. 30 caliber machine guns. Okay. Um, and that so that's what you carried for the for the the uh, the remainder of the the time yes, that you were in uh -huh. service, okay. right? Was that a was that a uh, tripod mounted or a ground mounted? It was tripod mounted. Okay. Now I've I've got to go back a little bit. I I misstated something. There. Sure. We were I was actually at first the stretcher bearer. Oh. So. Okay. The training there was you know not very difficult. You <laughs> picked the guy up. And, Right, lugged him off the hill, but then later on we became machine gunners, light thirty. Okay. So, and so how long was that training at Pendleton? Uh, for I had been there a year and a half when Korea started. Mm -hmm. So, what unit were you assigned to there at Pendleton? But prior to the war, at Pendleton, off? yes, we were. We were part of uh, 7th Marines. Okay. 3-7. 3rd Battalion, 7th sure. Marines. Uh -huh. Okay. Um, so tell me a little bit about, um, I guess, the w what you perceived as maybe the attitude of, um, uh, you know, those, your fellow, yourself and, and and your fellow Marines, and even any civilians that you might have known at that time in the run-up to um, to the Korean War, whenever it looked like things were going to kick off over there. Oh, we were gung-ho, ready to go. Okay. Oh, yes. It's a lot of excitement. We were finally getting to do the job we had been prepared for. Right, right. And uh, I think guys were actually <laughs> fighting each other for berths to go to Korea. <laughs> Okay. Yeah. So, uh, I know from from uh, from my research, I know that the um, that the U.S. military had kind of been uh, downsized after World War II. Yes, it had uh, been. Um, and so there was, uh, as far as equipment, were you lacking in any equipment or anything like that uh, prior to heading out? <clears throat> I think the Marine Corps is always lacking in equipment because we get what the Navy does want. Sure. But uh, as far as ammunition and, and weapons and all, we were well taken care of. Okay, okay. Um, so what day did you find out that you were heading to Korea? Do you remember what date that was roughly? Yes, well I left August 16th, mm -hmm. and I probably knew two weeks before that that we would be going. That was August 16th, 1950? Yes, of 50, right. Okay. Uh -huh. And so you, um, so you knew a couple of weeks prior to that. So. Oh yes, yes. So August sixteenth, uh, you're boarding boats to head out. Uh, We're boarding ships. Ships. Okay. <laughs> okay. What kind of ships uh, did you brought you? Uh, APAs, attack transports. Okay. 
Yeah. Okay. How long was that trip coming over? 16 days. 16 days, my uh -huh. God. Yeah. Uh, we docked at Kobe, Kobe, Japan, mm -hmm. and uh, reloaded the ships for a, for a combat landing, mm -hmm. and uh, got back on the ships and took off for Korea, and uh, arrived there on September 15th. Wow. Wow. So, so you arrived September fifteenth. Um, when uh, during your transport over prior to reaching Kobe, Japan, um, was there any continued training or? No, not there wasn't. Okay. Now some of the guys did. A lot of the fellows who were reservists. They'd never fired the M1 or any weapon, mm -hmm. and uh, they did have some training where the fellows would fire off the the uh, ship. Mm -hmm. and uh, get a little bit familiar with their weaponry. Mm -hmm. So that, that training, was that primarily conducted by the uh, um, the regular Marines? Oh yes, by regular been? Marines, uh-huh. Okay. Um, how about your your sleeping quarters uh, on those ships headed over? The what? How, your sleeping quarters on the ships headed <laughs> over, how were those? They were six, we were stacked six high. And uh, there was just about enough room, and you had your sleep, I mean, your uh, sea bag in between your legs. So everybody had their sea bags, and there was, uh, these things were six high. So you wanted to try to get one of the lower bunks, because <laughs> it was quite a chore to get up to the, the sixth rack. I'll bet. So were there, um uh, see, were you were you hot racking it? Were there guys in the racks during the day that would rotate out or, or anything oh, no. like that? No. no, no, we did not do that. Okay. Uh, yeah. Now I slept topside. I didn't want to be down below quarters. Okay. So I'd sneak up and sleep under a landing boat or something. <laughs> I see. I see. Did many many of your uh, uh, fellow Marines do that? Kind of get out of the. Uh, don't think a lot of them did, but I certainly did. <laughs> okay, okay. So, so you land in Kobe, and then 16 late days later, you're you're heading out uh, for uh, for Korea. For Incheon. For Incheon. Right. Uh -huh. okay. The invasion of Incheon. Okay. Uh, let's talk about that for a little while. Um, okay. What were um, what were the preparations like? Getting ready for for that battle of Incheon. Uh, not a whole lot. We'd, we'd been trained thoroughly back in the States, except for the reservists. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them were just, went in cold. Hmm. Okay. Now climbing those nets, that's where the danger is. You know, they didn't let us go up gangplanks. We had to climb up and down the, the nets, the landing nets. Yes. And that's quite a, quite a chore when you've got a weapon on your shoulder and you're ammunition and helmet on and mm -hmm. uh, it was what was your combat load for ammunition heading, my what what was your combat load for ammunition how much ammunition would you oh, be carrying uh, I had 10 rounds and a cartridge belt mm -hmm. I'm sorry 10 clips 10 full clips and a yeah cartridge 10 belt. full clips okay. and then we in Korea we had bandoliers too mm -hmm. that had like another eight clips per bandolier. Okay. About 20 rounds per clip? Uh, uh, eight, eight, eight rounds, rounds per clip. Eight yeah, rounds for per the clip. For the M1, yeah. Okay. Okay. And, the, and those were just inserted from the top side down? Yes, uh-huh. So. That's where the term M1 thumb came from because you had to push it down and if you didn't get your thumb out of there it would really whack you good. You'd get struck by the bolt? Yes. <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, okay, so um, let's take a look here. So you're you're trained as a as a machine gunner. Uh -huh. um, can you tell me a little bit about the uh, the men that you served with, the men that you arrived there in Incheon? With? Oh, I had been with most of them for up to three years mm -hmm. or two and a half years, mm -hmm. all the way back to Paris Paris Island. And then all of them uh, at Pendleton for probably a year, so we were very, very close. Okay. 
close knit. You do you recall any of their names? Oh, good lord, yes. Yeah. And any of them that you'd like to talk about here? Uh, Gene Holland. Gene Holland. Yes, he was my dearest friend. He was killed at at the reservoir. At the reservoir. And my okay. son is named for him. I see. Yeah, anyone else? Uh, yeah, they're just scads of them. Uh, <laughs> okay. Like I say, we'd been together for for some up to three years mm -hmm. with some of the guys. Okay. But Gene was my my best friend. Okay. What was his function? What was oh. his What was his job as well? He was machine gunner. Machine gunner also. Yeah. Okay. He was killed on my gun. Mm. Oh, see, yeah. I see. How, how did that occur? That uh, we it was between Hagaru and Kotori mm -hmm. where the Chinese hit us really hard. <clears throat> and during the fight. Uh, I don't know if it was a mortar round or a grenade or what, but I heard him when he got hit. I was maybe 10 foot feet away, mm -hmm. and I heard him say, ow, I think I'm hit, and he, and he died. So he was only 20 years old. Mm. Where was he from? Do you remember? He was from uh, California, okay. Pasadena. Okay. Wonderful boy. Okay. His family, though, were from Oklahoma. <laughs> they were, he was part Choctaw Indian. I see. Uh huh. I see. Well, that makes sense that him being from California and part Oklahoma, and may, he may have had relatives that were that headed out after the uh, or yeah. during the Dust Bowl. Yes, uh -huh. sure. Okay. Um. So let's go. Let's st step back just a bit to the Battle of of Inchon and start okay. there, and, and then we can go forward to uh, okay. the Battle of Chosen. How long were you were you engaged in the battle there at Inchon? At Inchon, it it was over. Uh, it really was two battles. The battle, the original one was Womi Do, which was an island uh, guarding the harbor at uh, Inchon, and the Fifth Marines went in and took took Womi Do, and we went in two days later to Inchon. And immediately start, got on trucks and went toward Seoul, hmm. and we recaptured Seoul. Uh, how after long, that, how long was that? How long was that process? Uh, as far um, as the battles in Seoul to take Seoul down? Probably two, th two to three weeks. Okay. Okay, so that would have put you well into October. By yes. That time. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um. Anything significant from from the uh, the retaking of Seoul that that comes to mind? The what? Anything significant from your experiences there in Seoul that comes to mind? Uh, yeah, I had a very significant thing happen to me. I picked up a little Korean whose parents had been killed, mm -hmm. and uh, I kept him with me and kept him supplied with food and all till till we left two weeks later. His name was Butchie. Butch, <laughs> and uh, it broke my heart when I had to leave him. He was only like eight years old. Oh my! No parents, oh no my. one to take care of him. Was there anyone that you were able to leave him with, or? I did. I left him with uh, some Korean civilian workers, and two months later, or a month later, at at Chosun Reservoir, I was up at Chosun at that time. And some of my buddies were back at Hung Nam, and guess who showed up? Butch. He rode trains, he hitchhiked until he found my buddies. And they told him that I was up north, and he kind of disappeared after that. So oh. whether he went up north trying to find me or not, I never did find out. Wow. Wow. So... Uh See, so when you arrive uh, initially for the, the move forward to uh, Chosen, what, yeah. what, what was the initial plan? Heading, what was what? What was the initial plan heading up there? Of, at Chosen? Mm -hmm. Was to drive up to the Yalu and drive all the North Koreans. Of course, at that time we were start, still fighting North Koreans. Mm -hmm. 
and not Chinese. They didn't enter until we we got up to uh, Hagaru and you damn me. Mm -hmm. So you're um, you're traveling north there. Uh, at what at what date uh, do you remember that you you arrived at Chosen initially? Uh, let's see. And you were with the two seven at that time, <clears throat> right? Yes. Uh huh. Okay. Um, I must have gotten up there. Oh, I know when it was. Let me backtrack just a little bit. Sure. It was Thanksgiving night when they called my gun. We were still at Hung Nam, and they called us and told us to be ready to go north the next morning. So that would have been November 24th or something mm -hmm. like that. And uh, the trip up to Chosen was, I went up by truck. Mm -hmm. It was not that long a trip, it was like 75 miles. That was from Kolari uh, uh, to, to Hagaru? No, Kolari to Hagaru was 10 miles. Okay. But from Hung Nam to, oh. uh, to Chosun was 75 miles. I see, I see. So the, uh, the initial push up there uh, to Chosun was to, uh, to push the, the Chinese back over the Yalu River. No, the Chinese hadn't entered the war yet. I see. We were still fighting North Koreans. North Koreans. It was to drive the North Koreans out. Back out. Okay. And when we got that close to the Chinese, we were 40 miles from Manchuria. And that's when the Chinese came into the war. Mm. Okay. So the, um, where was your first... Um, uh, uh, conflict, I, I guess, or what, mm -hmm. where did you run into your first um, uh, resistance, I guess, from the, at, from at the North Korea? At Incheon? Yeah. Okay. But at Chosun, it was uh, November 27th when they hit us. Mm -hmm. The Chinese hit us hard mm -hmm. on November 27th. Can you, can you talk a little bit about that? Just kind of detail what, what occurred on the 27th of November? Uh, yeah, <laughs> thousands of Chinese <laughs> were trying. They had been ordered to annihilate us to the man mm -hmm. and the 1st Marine Division. Mm -hmm. They knew it would be a terrible blow to the country and to morale if they could annihilate the 1st Marine Division. Mm -hmm. So they hit us pretty hard and uh, we fought Luckily, I was on one side of the perimeter. We had set up a perimeter. We had a machine gun, listening post, machine gun, listening post, all the way around uh, where we were, the location that we were at. And uh, the Chinese hit us to the south, of, south, yeah, the south of where I was. Mm -hmm. So the initial attack was not directed toward the area that I was in. Mm -hmm. It was to come, but not not that night. Okay. So that first night, how many how many um, how many uh, of the North Koreans do you think you had? Oh my goodness! Coming at you, thousands. Thousands. Um, when we left, in fact, uh, this is something I'll never forget. We. Uh, were pulling out of Hagaru <clears throat> to go back south <clears throat> and there were Chinese dead laying on the road that had been smashed flat by our tanks and traffic. Mm. It was a horrible, horrible sight. So... Mm. That was after the battle when you're pulling back? Of the first night, yeah. Oh, after the first night? Yeah, the first night. Okay. Uh -huh. Um, did you sustain any injuries that first night, or? No, I did not. Okay. I did not. Okay. Um, so after that first night, what was the plan uh, after pulling back just a bit? Well, we, we stayed and fought uh, 
for a few more days mm -hmm. until we were ordered to to come go back south to Hung Nam, okay. and uh, and that's when my major battle was between Hagaru and, and Kotori. No, between Hag. Yeah, between Hagaru and Kotori. The Chinese had everything. The only thing we had was the road to come down, and they had everything else. So mm -hmm. they told us when we left that we'd be running a, a gauntlet of enemy fire, and that became very true. Yeah. Hmm. Was there um, so you so you dug in for the the three or four days there at, at you uh, at, couldn't hardly dig in. <laughs> It was frozen solid, mm. but the uh, I was lucky being on machine guns. The uh, engineers had blasted holes, mm. dynamited holes for us, mm -hmm. so I had a fairly decent uh, place. We even had a little tin roof that protected us from the weather. I see. Who so who was in your uh, in your foxhole uh, with you there, or in that that? Uh, bomb out hole with you. Who was who was in there with you? Uh, Lloyd Lanham. Lloyd Lanham. Okay. Dear dear friend. Mm -hmm. Was he an assistant gunner to you, or he was the gunner? Okay. I think we were the only two. We both grew up in the Nazarene Church. I think we were the only two Nazarenes in the entire Marine Corps. <laughs> So he was the he was the gunner. Were, were you out working as the assistant gunner at that? Point? No, uh, uh, Johnny Murphy was the assistant gunner. I was an ammo carrier. Mm -hmm. My you... OMOS was machine guns, but I was an ammo carrier. Okay. I know. Um... Uh, with the mortar guys that they have to keep their ammo separate from their positions. Was that the case for, for your position or were you able to actually keep your ammo in that, um, uh, in your firing position? Uh, you? Well, we had, <clears throat> we had eight men on the cruise at that time. Mm -hmm. Six ammo bearers mm -hmm. and two, the gunner and assistant gunner. So we had like 12 cans of of ammunition, and I think there's 600 rounds in each can, so we had like 16 to 20 cans of ammo readily available. So, when the um, uh, when the engagement when when the battle engagement would incur, that, that now that would start at night, correct? Yes. How, how would that kick off? How was it? How, how would that kick off? How would the how would the battle kick off? I, I've I've read and I've and I've heard that uh, the Chinese and and the North Koreans would um, play trump or not trumpets. Trump, they bugles, bugles, yeah, yeah, bugles, bugles. And horns, and everything else, right? Yeah. And see, whistles. with the Chinese language, there are so many dialects that they had to use bugles for them to understand the commands. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they, they did. They, but I don't remember ever hearing the bugles. Mm -hmm. It was just plain attack. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it would just kind of open up with tracer fire. Yeah, mm -hmm. tracers. Though we took the tracers out because it gives your position away mm -hmm. very quickly. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. we were instructed to remove the tracers from our from our ammo. I see. And it kind of heats up the barrel oh, yeah. too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Right. So. That barrel burns up and you, <laughs> you, I don't know if it, we never had to change the barrel, but uh, yeah, it'll burn it up. Okay. Um, so, uh, so the battle goes through for several days and then you're pulling back to... Um, Hung Nam. Hung Nam. Okay. Uh huh. So, well, actually, you're you're initially heading from uh, Hagaru to uh, to Kotori. Kotori. Yeah, which we buried our dead, and I was put on the detail for burying our help to bury our dead. I see. And there were hundreds. I see. So we'd pick up a body. They just piled them up in a big old pile, and we'd reach in and 
pull somebody out and load him onto a stretcher. <laughs> hey, and we'd, we'd lift the uh, stretcher up to the end of the six by the truck mm -hmm. and just flop them on over. And then they took them. Daddy. So uh, they took them out to a burial site, which mm -hmm. I never did see that, but mm -hmm. I did help load the dead on. I see. Um. My first sergeant was in there, and my buddy Gene Holland was in there. My first sergeant won the Navy Cross hmm. that night or the night before. They were in the in the trucks that were yeah. Taking, he was taking he that was death. Three of my buddies, or two, two or three of my buddies, were on the road. Mm -hmm. One of them were wounded and one dead, and the other one able-bodied, and they were trying to. Get get across the road. And it was a truck was burning, and of course everything was lit up like day. And uh, Sergeant McClung was his name, William McClung. He ran out and was pulling the guys to safety when the Chinese killed him. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was your first sergeant. Yeah, and he, like I say, won the Navy Cross that. Funny, it happened probably within 10 yards of where I was, and I didn't know that till I read about it in a book. No kidding. Uh -huh. That that sort of happens though when you're oh yeah when, when you're engaged. Oh uh, yeah. In a situation like Cause that. Because all you know what's going on is probably six foot. Yes. Yeah. Six, yeah, six foot in e either direction and uh -huh. six foot yeah. in front of you. Inter uh, interlocking fire and all. Mm -hmm. Um, so, so you said the primary uh, place that you you ran into a significant battle was was that in Hell Hellfire Valley. Hellfire Valley was further south. Okay. Which I went through. Mm -hmm. The next two days later, terrible, okay. terrible scene. Okay. At Hellfire Valley. Can you tell us about that significant? Uh, part of the, the retreat back prior to getting to Hellfire Valley? Well, Hellfire Valley was took place when the uh, relief column tried to fight into us and the Chinese just slaughtered them. Mm -hmm. And that Scotch was part of that group that uh, eventually made it in, but mm -hmm. it, it was just dead everywhere. Mm -hmm. okay. so, I saw a Marine, I, under a truck and a dog. And I thought, well, what they're doing under there? And I started to walk over to them and it, I realized they were both frozen, hmm. solid, just sitting there. And I thought, boy. That was underneath, the, they were underneath the six by? Yeah. Hmm. Um. So, so prior to um, to getting to to Hellfire Valley, what, uh, what kind of you said there was a significant uh, battle or a significant event? Oh, it's just mainly sniper fire between after that initial attack mm -hmm. uh, when they really laid into us, mm -hmm. but uh, it, it was it was ten miles. We probably had covered half of that, so we had like five miles to go to get to Coto Reef, and there wasn't a whole lot of action at that point. Um, anything uh, um, stick out in your mind as far anything. as anything? Anything seemed prominent? Anything seemed stick out in your mind from that specific part of? of uh, uh, pulling back? Uh, of course, losing Gene Holland mm -hmm. and uh, my first sergeant. Mm -hmm. uh, other than that, I can't think of any significant facts that, except seeing Chesty Puller for the first time. <laughs> Where was that at? At Cotoree. Was it? Yeah, they were back. He was back at Cotoree 
And as we pulled in after fighting all night, Chesty was standing there to I don't welcome us or whatever. But sure, sure. First and only time I ever saw a puller. Yeah. Um, for those who don't know, who who was he? Uh, he was a Marine legend. <laughs> <laughs> the men all, to this day, they look up to Chesty. They say good night, Chesty Puller in boot camp. <laughs> um. Um, I, uh, some of the other gentlemen that I've talked to um, uh, have talked about um, significant things or, or um, uh, the best of, of uh, humanity and the worst of humanity. The what? I'm sorry. The best of humanity and the worst of humanity yeah. uh, in war and that, and that 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 can be seen. Um, can you, do you have any, do you have any, uh, anything that might come to mind for either one of those as far as the best of humanity, things you might have seen? Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, just the best of humanity. Uh, whether oh, the it was, best of humanity. Yeah. During that time. Yeah. I, we had a Catholic chaplain with us and, uh, he was in a radio van in fact, I was standing next to the radio van when bullets started pinging through it, and I thought, gosh, what is that? But anyhow, the chaplain was in there, and his his assistant covered his body, or covered the chaplain with his own body and was killed. So I that was one. one. Uh, I've often thought about it. I think who won, who lost, we all lost. Nobody won anything. It was just a waste of human life, as far as I'm concerned. Mm -hmm. And uh, But I'm sure there were many acts of bravery, like I was saying, Sergeant McClung ran out on the road to pull in my, my friends. And I'm sure that was occurring all up and down that road, probably. Mm -hmm. um, how about uh, probably the worst of humanity? I know I've I've heard some some stories uh, that were just terrible. Yeah, worst I, of humanity. I, and the reason I ask, I I think it's important. Um, um, for, for uh, historical reasons, uh, for people to be able to, to see both sides uh -huh. um, and, and have maybe have examples of both There's sides. One, 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 one thing happened. I was in a ditch with a wounded Chinese for all pretty much all of one night. He was wounded badly. And uh, when a truck behind me was hit by mortar or grenade fire, it burst into flames, and I had to vacate that position pretty quickly because mm -hmm. I, I could see bullets striking the ground around me because I was not silhouetted, but I, I could be seen by the enemy. And I finally had to screw up all my courage and crawl over this wounded Chinese. Uh, I made it, got to the other side of the road. The next morning, as we were preparing, picking up our dead and wounded, uh, the Chinese was still in the ditch. And uh, my lieutenant said, uh, is that man dead? I said, I don't know, sir. Last night he was still alive. And about that time the Chinese lifted his head and my first, my lieutenant took out his forty-five and shot him. Now, that may have been humane, because the man was badly wounded, mm -hmm. was freezing undoubtedly to death. And I've, I've, I've struggled with that for many a year, uh, thinking about that. Was that humane or inhumane? Mm -hmm. In some respects, one of, uh, both, I guess. And that happened as we were going, Chinese 
you could see their breath, the, the ones that were living, especially at Hellfire Valley, and uh, we were ordered to kill them. And I was ordered to kill a, a wounded Chinese. I couldn't do it. And the guy behind me killed him. But there was a lot of inhumane looking back on it now. Mm -hmm. But what can you do? So they, they, were, they were killed. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure they did the same to us. I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, I'm sure that, that that sort of thing still happens even today. Yeah, oh yeah. I'm sure. sure. I'm sure. Um, I was a very kind, gentle soul. Hmm. And really, it really bothered me and hurt me. And uh, probably where a lot of my PTSD came from was seeing the inhumanity between people. Yeah. Um, were you, um, well, how many casualties were in your unit? Do you know? How many what? How many casualties did you have in your unit over the, over the course Just of the battle? Just in my unit? Yes. We had one killed and seven wounded. Just in my little little group. How how many in your little group? Uh, just the machine gun squad. Okay. So how many? For those people who don't know, how many people would make up a machine gun squad? Well, usually six, but at that point we had eight. Okay. Yeah. So one killed and, and how many wounded? Uh, let me think. Probably three. Okay. Three wounded. Okay. Yeah. So roughly 50 percent. Yeah. Oh yeah, it was 50 percent. I okay. should have said that because I knew that <laughs> we lost 50 percent, and I didn't get a scratch. Wow. I I lived with survivor's guilt for a long time. How how do you how do you deal with that? Uh, they put me on medication. <laughs> The VA, yeah. Mm -hmm. So what kind of, uh, uh, with the survivor's guilt, what, what kind of uh, outward effects? Uh, just complete, uh, for example, I might be walking on a beautiful spring day, I remember this happening, and uh, just really enjoying it, and all of a sudden, it was like a sledgehammer had hit me. And I'd go into deep, deep depression and uh, just thinking on a beautiful day that all the carnage and everything that I had seen uh, really would go into deep depression. Mm -hmm. And I had a bad habit of, I had like three books on Chosen and I would read them and read them and reread them like I couldn't let go, so. Hmm. Hmm. So is uh, sitting and talking about uh, with with, with uh, the guys from the group here in town. Does that? Uh, do you ever sit and chat about those things or? No, we don't. You don't. We never. Chosen never comes up. No kidding. Uh uh. No. Hmm. It's strange. I've, I've, we just get together and enjoy, just enjoy each other. Right. And uh, nobody ever, I can't remember anybody ever mentioning chosen. Yeah. Because we have a prayer, mm -hmm. pledge of allegiance, and then a prayer for our departed comrades. And, sure. And uh, other than that, no. Uh-uh. Huh. Okay. Now, how are you going to talk to another guy about, oh, let me tell you how cold it was. <laughs> he knows how cold it was. <laughs> exactly. Hmm. So, so um, uh, as far as the, the uh, survivor's guilt and all of that. Yeah. Um, did you, uh, 
of course, you, you said you know he'd gotten some medications. Yes. And w- did you participate in any group kind of therapy or any group talk? Or I went like to that? group therapy for a while uh-huh. with Vietnam veterans mostly, mm-hmm. and I just didn't fit in, so mm-hmm. I dropped out. Mm-hmm. I don't know why. I just felt like an odd man. A different and generation or just different war? Or? Different war. Okay. Different, different feelings. I see. Toward the casualties and the war, but I couldn't handle it, yeah. so I dropped out. Okay. Um, were you uh, awarded any medals or citations for your your service? Yeah, um, I've got like twelve medals, but one for for uh, valor. I hate to say that, sound like, but I did receive a medal for valor. Well, that's okay. That's the lowest ranking medal for valor. <laughs> Marine Corps Commendation uh, Medal with V mm-hmm. for valor. Mm-hmm. What what did what was that for specifically? Uh, it was for chosen. Just for the battle itself, yeah. for being yeah. a participant in that battle. Uh-huh. I see. It wasn't for a specific action during that No, battle. no, uh-uh. Okay, okay. Um, let's see here. Supplies, uh, while you were there in Chosen, uh, were you ever at, um, uh, at risk of, of not having supplies or running low on supplies oh, or ammo? goodness, yeah. Okay. Yeah. How was that? Airdrops. Okay. Yeah, uh-huh. So those airdrops would occur during the daytime? During the daytime. Okay. A lot of them went over to the Chinese, so they probably got as much as we did. <laughs> so it kind of served to prolong the battle a little bit, I guess. Yeah. Uh-huh. But we did. We were very short on ammunition. Really? In fact, between between Kotori and Hagaru, we had run out, mm-hmm. and they got a tank through us. Mm. Just in the nick of time with the ammo, mm. but there was no other way to resupply us except by a tank I getting see. through to us. Was there a um, any kind of rule of thumb for for ammo conservation? Oh no, no. no. Well, yeah, there is from boot camp on. Mm-hmm. You know, when it, they tell you that when when you fire your weapon, there better be a dead dead man at the other end of it Mm -hmm. so Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't just wantonly fire it it had to be specific targets and all to conserve conserve ammunition and the two most terrifying words in the English language occurred up there and when we run out of ammo and and uh, our major, who is called Fearless Freddie Simpson, yelled, fix bayonets. Mm-hmm. Now that is terrifying. <laughs> yeah. So you had to fix bayonets at one point in time? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay. How- That's when they got the tank through it to us, though, just just in the nick of time. Okay, so you weren't actually, you didn't have to engage in any no. hand-to-hand at that point no. in time? No, okay. thank goodness, because okay. they out, outmanned us. We had like 47 guys in my group Mm-hmm. And they probably had a, I think they estimated a battalion and a half of Chinese hit us, wow. the 47 of us. So a battalion and a half, just for those who wouldn't know, how many would that comprise? Uh, how many in the Marine Corps, that'd be 1,500. Okay. So I th- think the Chinese were a little bit smaller than that. Okay. So they probably had around 2,000. Yeah, to, probably. To, to your 47. Yeah. Uh-huh. Okay. <laughs> Good grief. Yeah, that. That wouldn't have gone good if if your hand to hand wouldn't have that would have been quite an exercise. Uh, it would have been a horrible exercise. Yeah. Um, so did you uh, did you stay in the uh, Marines after um, uh, after the uh, after the Battle of Chosen? Oh yeah. How I had, how long were you in the? I in had the another year. <clears throat> Let's see. That was February. Yeah, I had a year to go. Mm. And they sent me back to Camp Pendleton. Okay. So you got, um, everyone was, uh, had marched out 
the, the 76 miles back yeah. to the coast. Right. Were you in, in Korea for a period of time before you uh, went back to Pendleton? or? Yeah. Oh, yeah, I had another year. Okay. I spent another year there. Another year in Korea? Yeah. After, after the Battle of after Chosen? After Battle, uh-huh. Okay. Where, whereabouts? Oh, gosh. Maesan, Pusan, Chun, Chun Chan, Chengju, just all over. I see. I was never, we were never just placed somewhere and, and stayed. We were constantly out in the field and on the move. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Um, did you uh, did you keep a diary during that time? Do what? Did you keep a diary or a journal oh, no. during that time? Nothing. Nothing. Uh -uh. Did you know of anyone that that may have? I'm sure there must have been. Sure. But I never remember anybody. Yeah. I had a little Bible Testament, New Testament. Yeah. My daughter has it. It was all waterlogged and. It's about that thick now when originally it was about that thick. Sure. But I think Sally has my testament from that period. I see. Um, ha, um, well, I was going to ask about um, letters from home. Uh, during that time, even through the the battle there at Chosun, or uh, did you have very much very many letters from home? Were you writing letters to home at that time? I didn't write much. <clears throat> I'm not much of a writer. Uh -huh. In fact, the Red Cross got on me about writing my mom because <laughs> <laughs> I just never never wrote. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, they were pretty good about writing me. Yeah, but mail's the only thing I think that keeps you really, your morale up to where you can go on. Yeah. We had a girl in my hometown that uh, she wrote me pretty regularly. Not a girlfriend or anything, just a girl I'd gone to school with. Uh -huh. How was that, getting letters from her? It was good. It was good. I had one girl, though, wrote me. <laughs> she said, uh, what would you do if on some dark night I snuck up and threw my arms around you? I said, I'd stick a bayonet in your gut. <laughs> oh, hacked her off. Oh, really boy. got her mad. That, that was by letter? That you yeah, that? I, guess she, I guess she thought we'd make mad, passionate lovers. <laughs> sure, sure. <laughs> so, uh, after you, you ended your service, that would have been like, 1952, probably? 52, I got out. Okay. Yeah, 48 to 52. Okay. What did you do after the service? I went back to steel mills uh -huh. and worked there for just a couple months and decided uh -huh. to go to college. So I went to southeastern Louisiana, in Hammond, Louisiana. Uh -huh. Met my wife, married her, and left school and went back and went back to work. Oh, wow. Okay. And um, did you uh, Pardon. Uh, did you uh, use the GI Bill at any time to go to school? Yes, I did for a short period. Uh -huh. It paid me. In fact, it paid me more than I did as a PFC in the Marine Corps. Hmm. I made seventy-five dollars a month in the Marine Corps, and I made a hundred seventeen going to school. <laughs> so it was quite a step up for me. <laughs> So what was the highest rank that you had achieved? Corporal. Corporal? Yeah. Okay. Um, did you join any uh, any veterans organizations later on? Just the chosen few. Just the chosen yeah. few. Yeah. Not the uh, no. VFW or the uh, uh -uh. the uh, American Legion? No. No. Any, any reason why? I, again, it was like that group of uh, veterans that, you know, I dropped out of the mm -hmm. group therapy. Mm -hmm. I just had no desire to to be around anyone. Mm -hmm. I, I became kind of recluse, not reclusive, but my my life changed pretty much drastically. Yeah. Lost my girlfriend. I was very mean to her when I came home. I wasn't very kind to her, let's put it that way. I guess, again, 
the survivor's guilt and all got to me. So we broke up and wonderful, wonderful girl. Yeah. Um, how do you, uh, how do you think the, that your experience at Chosen um, affected your, your civilian life from then going oh, forward? Oh, it's affected it. There's not a, not a day goes by that I don't think of it. Mm. Not a day. Good things and bad things, I'm sure. Good things and bad things, because there were good things. Mm -hmm. There were good things, yeah. So I don't dwell on the bad things, yeah. but but they're still there. Sure. Did you ever, uh, have you ever tried to figure out where Butchie might have gone to? Where what? Where, where Butchie might have ended up at? Yeah, we sure did. Me and my wife, we contacted the... Uh, missionaries uh -huh. in Japan and tried to find Butch but were unable to. Mm. So I hope I hope he made it. When when was that? When did you contact those missionaries? Oh in nineteen fifty two okay. after I got out. Uh huh. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Mm. Nothing but nothing showed up. No, nothing. Okay. Uh uh. I guess just a a couple more Questions okay. for you. Um, uh, would you? Would you? If you could jump in a, a time travel machine, would you do it again? Oh would you yes. Go back and do it again. If I could serve with the same guys that I served with. Yeah. Yeah, I sure would. Why? Why? Why so? Tell me why. Camaraderie. Yeah. Uh, I was never closer to any group of people in my life than, than the chosen guys. Mm. I'm, my brother, he's a former Marine also, I, I feel closer to them than I do to my own brother, and I love him dearly. But certainly understand that. I do, do understand that. Um, any, uh, any words for, um, for anyone that might uh, be reading this or listening to, any words for, for anyone that might be reading this or, or listening to this or watching this about um, uh, what it means to serve uh, to me it meant everything I, uh, I'm still proud of my service uh, I would do it again if need be I love my country, I love my flag, it still gives me flutters to see the flag flying and uh, just love your country and be ready to defend it against all, against any evil, so. All right, I agree, I absolutely <laughs> agree. <laughs> well, um. I, I, I want to thank you for, for giving me the opportunity to meet with you today and, well, I and hope uh, I haven't talk been with you. Too boring. Oh no, not a bit. <laughs> it's been a, a great experience for me so far and yeah. I certainly appreciate your time.